the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. This is the story of the Pacific, the drama of the millions of people who live around this greatest sea, where the United States is now committed to a long-term policy of keeping the peace. This, as another public service of the National Broadcasting Company, is the background story of the events in the Pacific and their meaning to us and to the generations to come. Nanking, symbol of victory. I could hardly believe it. At last, we were coming back to Nanking. Thoughts of how we had left on foot, battered and beaten, and of all that had happened in the eight years since, surged up in me and blended with the roar of the engine. We will be landing in a few minutes now, Chao Yong Ti. Yes. Look at the city below us. Nanking lay like a great intricate pattern below us, on the right bank of the Yangtze. 200 miles up the river from Shanghai. Look at all the highways and roads running into the city and the great wall enclosing it. Yes. We were coming back. Not on foot this time, fleeing in the night, but flying back to accept the surrender of those who had chased us out eight years ago. <laughs> This was Nanking, beautiful, bloody Nanking. Nanking, which was 600 years old at the time of Christ. This was the scene of some of China's greatest struggles, Chinese against Chinese and Chinese against the foreign aggressors. This was the last resting place of Sun Yat-sen. We went to his white marble mausoleum on the slopes of Purple Mountain. I stood there in the quiet. Nothing had changed around the mausoleum, except that the trees had grown to some height. We waited for the key to unlock the inner temple. Here rested the man who, more than any other, had inspired us toward freedom and a better life. After the Manchus had been overthrown in 1911, he became the first president of the Republic in China. In the interest of national unity, I shall be glad to withdraw in favor of Yuan Shikai. Will Yuan Shikai then come here to Nanking, Dr. Sun? Nanking is the capital of the Republic. But Yuan Shikai has established himself in Peking. Peking has for centuries been the capital of the Manchus. The capital of the Republic should be here in Nanking. Here we have drawn up our provisional constitution. And here we have established the government of the people. But can we persuade Yuan Shikai, now that you have turned over the presidency to him, to move here to Nanking? They could not. Yuan Shikai stayed in Peking. But Dr. Sun Yat-sen never gave up the thought of having the government of the Republic in Nanking. Trouble came, and Dr. Sun and Yuan Shikai fell out. Dr. Sun saw that there must be an expedition to overcome the northern militarists and bring all of China under one government. This was his dream until he died in 1925. And the next year, the northern expedition was launched. Chiang Kai-shek has stormed and captured Chiang Sha. In Nanking, all was tenseness as we waited. Chiang Kai-shek has taken Nanchang and Fujian. We wondered how it would be when he reached Nanking. Chiang Kai-shek has taken Hangzhou and is moving on Nanking. Nanking vibrated with excitement the day the city fell. Look at them. Those are the forces that will unify China. They will succeed if the party itself does not split. Because Chiang expelled the rebels from the party? Yes. This northern expedition cannot succeed if there is serious dissension within the expedition itself. The day after Nanking was occupied, the trouble came. Chaos has broken loose in Nanking. Mobs are sweeping through the city, attacking foreign property, raiding consulates, looting, and murdering. So far in the wild confusion, no one has been able to fix blame for the outbreak. Under whose orders the troops are operating is still not known. The entire city... 
by the time the outrage had subsided, the foreign press was furious. Chiang Kai-shek should be held responsible. If the government of China is not able to maintain order, then it's time that outsiders stepped in. The Nanking affair is a disgrace. And those responsible should be held to strict accountability. Which factions were responsible for the incident did not at once come out, but we knew that it was a plot to discredit Zhang Kai-shek. Zhang took full personal responsibility for the affair. And here at Nanking, where he had faced one of his greatest trials, he established the seat of the government and invited the support of all who were opposed to communism. So Nanking was a capital again, but a shaky. I have the key now for the inner temple. Oh, yes. If you will follow me, please. We walk to the door of the inner temple. We enter the tomb of our Sun Yat-sen. filed in around the casket. It was as if Sun Yat-sen had been waiting here for our return all this time, all these eight years. The tomb was hallowed with all that Dr. Sun means to us, with all that he means to China. Not until the state burial of Dr. Sun here had Nanking been accepted as the capital of China. And with his death, Dr. Sun had at last consecrated this city of Nanking. And now we had come back, after all that had happened, to re-establish the capital here. We bowed three times, and then we filed quietly up. The Japanese soldiers bowed stiffly as we drove by. Their day was done. Their occupation had ended as the other occupations had ended. In the 6th century, Nanking was utterly destroyed. I could hear my teacher telling me that when I was a boy. The conquering hordes came, and they leveled to the ground every building. And they plowed up the lands inside the city walls, so that no trace of its beauty should remain. I looked at the ancient walls, gracefully they followed up the hills and down over the rolling country. How long had those walls stood there? Many, many centuries. I thought of the many gates, Quanghua Gate, Chung Shan Gate, and all the others. Once Nanking had been even a bigger city than it is today, the biggest walled city in the world. This archway that stands here on the land, I tell, once marked the way to a bridge. A farmer had told me that when, as a boy, I had stood in the field studying the archway. But the bridge is long since gone. Only the ancient archway stood there, the furrows of the till lamb running through it and alongside it. Yes, the bridges were gone as the porcelain pagoda was gone. It stood up there on the hill, a tower of beauty. It had glazed tiles of a hundred colors. Its graceful overhanging eaves were sparkling green. And from its delicate cornices hung 150 bells. I could hear my teacher saying that. Then the Taiping rebels came. They swept through the country, killing and pillaging and burning as they went. They blew up the porcelain pagoda, and they left Nanking little more than a waste of smoldering ruins. Slowly, the city rose again, but very slowly. I played along the river when I was a boy, and when I was big enough to go to Shanghai for the first time, I realized that Nanking was a Chinese city, as Shanghai was a cosmopolitan city. In Nanking, there were no foreign concessions. Some foreigners there were in Nanking, but not traders. Mostly they were scholars and missionaries and diplomats. We will be at Chungshan Gate in a few minutes now, Chung. Chungshan Gate, yes. I am eager to see it. I remember Chungshan Gate so well. You see, Joe, they're cutting this road straight through from the waterfront on the Yang Sea here to the Chungshan Gate. An American missionary explained it all to it will be a modern highway. It will be called Chungshan Road. But, Mr. Townsend, how can they build a road through all of those houses? The houses will have to come down. But that is the way of progress. Progress. It was the first time I understood its real meaning. The road will go through the old city wall near Drum Tower, and on through the banking circle in the business section. I watched the thousands of coolies working with modern machinery. Look, Chow. 
Look at the people gathered to greet us ahead there at Chungshan Gate. Yes, they're waving flags and shouting with joy. Let us stop for a moment, shall we? By all means, yes. How's the Generalissimo? Generalissimo is fine. Oh. He is fine. I think they've waited these years. Generalissimo is in excellent health. When will the Generalissimo come? He will come here when all is ready for him. He will be here. Oh, no. You are Chao Yong Ti? Yes. Yes, I'm Chao Yong Ti. I am Yu Fen. You remember me? Yu Fen? Yes. Remember, you used to give me rice. Yu Fen was a boy. <laughs> I was only ten years old then. That was just before the Japanese came. Yes. I am 18 now. 18? You have been here in Nanking all this time? Yes. All this time. We drove down Chungshan Road. A thousand impressions tumbled through my mind. The old familiar landmarks, people... Words, the side streets, the everlasting hills. This city had been built by the younger generation, the progressive, the enterprising. They had cut this road through the city. They had put up these magnificent buildings, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Metropolitan Hotel, the... But now their magnificence was marred, scarred by the ruthless hands of the Japanese. digging in the ruins, trying to clean up some of the wreckage that September day in 1937. The Japanese had bombed the city 16 times in the last week. And then Admiral Kiyosha Hasegawa's announcement came. Nanking is condemned. This is a warning to all foreigners to leave at once before the final phase of the bombing. They are going to bomb us more than we've had this last week. Hasegawa says that he will wipe Nanking from the face of the earth. What good is it then to clean up this wreckage? Let us see if there are any more injured or dead before we stop. Ah, yes. Oh, all of you, hurry now with the search. There is little time. In 1937, the world knew little of the bombing of cities. We waited through the dreadful hour. We even dared to hope. But this we gave up after word came of the attitude of the Japanese newspaper. Admiral Hasegawa is to be honored for his chivalry in giving advance warning to foreigners to save themselves by leaving the city. By his warning, he has... Admiral Hasegawa has shown himself a true samurai in applying the Bushido code to Nanking. The foreigners have been warned. Let them and the enemy Chinese act with equal honor. The Admiral should be given... We must do all we can to prepare air raid shelters, Joe. Dr. Townsend, the missionary, whipped along with the rest of us. If there is only enough time. Everyone is working, Dr. Thomas. We must not stop until there is shelter for all. While we dug, others put up arrows pointing to the shelter. Is that the air raid, sir, and so? Yes. Yes, it is. Everyone down in the shelters. Everyone down in the shelters. Hurry! Hurry! Down into the shelters! Hurry! Hurry, hurry! The bombers are coming! Everyone down in the shelter. There were 40 Japanese bombers in that first place. The earth trembled as the bombs thundered down. The second raid came only 30 minutes after the first. Explosive and incendiaries dropped for hours. The flames licked high up into the sky. When night came, the darkness was pierced with the gleam of the roaring fire. The bombers kept coming back. At last, it stopped. They're coming! They're coming! I saw them! Uh, where did you see them, Sai? I saw them! A Japanese patrol at the San Yat-sen Memorial! They're closing They're in. Already at Purple Mountain? Yes. Yes, I saw them looking down across the city. We could not dream of what was before. The bombing had been merciless. The city was shattered. The magnificent buildings were mangled. 
Ching Chan Road and Taiping Road were lanes of wreckage. The Japanese surged into the city like a tidal wave, and the people by the thousands swarmed to the shores of the Yangtze and scrambled to get onto rafts and into boats to try to get across to the north bank. Japanese planes! Japanese planes! They are diving to save us! Get down! Get down! Then the looting started. The stores and houses still standing were stripped of all their stock and furnishings, loaded onto stolen wagons and motor cars and hauled away. Will you leave nothing for us at all? Get out of the way! Those who died this way were lucky. Some were bayoneted, and some were tied together in tight bundles of 40 and 50. Gasoline was poured over them until they were saturated. Then there was separate fire. They were marched out in large groups and mowed down. God, give us courage. Dr. Townsend. Prince. Grant everlasting peace unto all who have died. And to all who are about to die, grant strength to face this ordeal as thou faced it on Calvary. And to these who oppress us, though they torture us and kill us, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Plane, plane, the planes are coming back. They are not dropping bombs. No, no, they are dropping leaflets. Look, thousands of leaflets. The leaflets fluttered down like leaves in an autumn wind. When the planes were gone, some of the leaflets were brought into the compound. Look at the picture on them. It was a colored picture of a Japanese soldier with a Chinese child, like the Christ child, in his arms. A Chinese mother was bowing at his feet, thanking him for the rice he has given us. What does it say there? It says, all good Chinese who return to their homes will be fed and clothed. Japan wishes to be a good neighbor to those Chinese not fooled by monsters who are Chiang Kai-shek soldiers. Japanese soldiers, they're coming this way. Dr. Townsend, Dr. Townsend. Yeah? They're setting fire to this whole section. We must stay here. We must help the suffering. We looked at each other. Dr. Townsend's calm made us The Japanese went from place to place along Ping Shan Road and Taiping Road and put the torch to the buildings after they had looted them. They plundered the American embassy, the British embassy, and the German embassy. On Christmas Eve, all Taiping Road was in flames. On New Year's Day, a Japanese merchant ship arrived. We made our way down to the Yangtze to see it tied up at the dock. Look, it is filled with Japanese sightseers. Yes, sightseers. And the city still burning. Yeah. I hope what they see, they will never forget. The visitors were conducted on a tour through the streets that had been cleared of wreckage. Some of them gave sweets to the bewildered Chinese children and patted their frightened heads. These are the ones, Chow, who would try to make Nanking a Japanese city. A few days later, the Japanese papers from Shanghai reached Nanking. We read what the Japanese said about Nanking. Uh, Nanking is quiet. The refugees who fled for their lives from the midst of death have met with the gentle soothing of the uh, Japanese army. Many thousands of refugees cast off their former absurd attitudes of opposing Japan and clasp their hands in congratulations for receiving assurances of right. Men and women, old and young, bend down to kneel in salutation to the Imperial Army. On New Year's Eve, I slipped out of Nanking. Nanking was lost. 
Again, Nanking was ravaged. As I went away from it, all I could think of was its ruin. And yet I knew that Nanking was more than a city. It was a symbol. How, how changed it all is, Tao. Yes. The streets are clear. The important buildings are repaired. Many of the old buildings are gone. Yes, but... But look at all the Japanese shops in their place. Yes. And all the Japanese. There were never so many Japanese civilians in Nanking. They came here when the heavy bombing of Japan started last summer. After the fall of Nazi Germany. How ironic. They came here to Nanking to escape bombing. Yes. Oh, there is the beautiful Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yes. Wang Ching Wei must have been mortified that General Nisho used that as the headquarters of the Japanese Army of Occupation and put him, the head of the puppet state, in that old building. Wang Ching Wei had been Prime Minister of the Nationalist Government in Nanking. He had gone along with Chiang Kai-shek to Chongqing to carry on the fight against the Japanese. He had said... The Japanese are like thieves in a house. They must be put out. And then after he had left Chongqing and gone over to the Japanese, his attitude changed. I urged the Generalissimo to stop hostilities with Japan. He rebuked me and led me out of the party and called me a traitor. I knew it was hopeless to stay longer in Chongqing. Ah, uh, Chao. Yes? There's the examination ministry where Wang Ching Wei was inaugurated as the head of the Japanese puppet government. Yes. It was in March 1940. After three postponements, Wang Ching Wei today promulgated what he and his Japanese overlords call the national government at Nanking. While the rain drizzled down outside, Wang stood in a circle of his puppets and made the announcement. Not one foreign nation except Japan was represented at the inauguration. After the ceremony, Wang signaled and those standing around him bowed deeply. This was the start of Japanese-dominated puppet government of China. The Japanese tried to bolster Wang's prestige by sending General Nobuyuki Abe to Nanking as special envoy and ambassador. But no amount of boasting could make Wang Ching Wei or the Nanking government more than puppets. I remember the secret reports that reached us in Chongqing. Fighting has broken out in Nanking between Wang Ching Wei's troops and the Japanese. Wang Ching Wei has again tried to give up his regime as president of the Nanking government and go to Hong Kong. But again, he has not been able to do it. We got reports of his failing health and at the same time of the growing strength of the Japanese in Nanking. They have made the Ministry of Foreign Affairs the inner sanctum of the Japanese military in China. We kept close tab on all that was happening in Nanking. The Japanese are realizing that they made a bad deal when they set up the Wang Qingwei regime. But now that they have recognized it and supported it, they cannot abolish it without losing faith. Wang could neither rule nor escape. Wang Qingwei died today after receiving treatment for eight months in the hospital. Chen Kung Po has been named to succeed him. Chen Kung Po. The Japanese news agency Domei has reported that Chen Kung Po has killed himself. Yes, that is what they have said. All this had happened here. All this and so very much more. Every building, every street corner, every gate and archway and park called up more of the deep meaning of Nanking. Here, China had raised its highest hopes. Here, it had suffered one of its greatest tragedies. Here, the anguish of the people had turned to bitterness. But now, all that was past. The puppet government was gone. The Japanese were defeated. And we were back to accept their surrender. The auditorium of the Central Military Academy was decked with the flag of the United Nations. This is China's hour, Chow. Yes. It hardly seems real after so long. So long. Eight years of heartbreaking warfare since the Marco Polo Bridge incident. Fourteen years since the Mukden incident. Fourteen years of bloodshed. Death to millions. Suffering to many, many millions. And a ravaged 
desolated country. And now this, here at Nanking. Look at the representatives of the other nations there. The United States, Britain, the Netherlands, Canada, Russia, France, Australia. The representatives of the United Nations were expressionless. I looked at the Japanese commander, Lieutenant General Okamura. Has any nation's humiliation ever been so great, Charles? I almost pity the Japanese. Look at General Ho Jing Chin. The commander-in-chief of the Chinese forces was serene. General Okamura took off his glasses. He looked grimly over the surrender paper. The Emperor of Japan, the Japanese government, and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters having recognized the complete military defeat of the Japanese military forces by the Allied forces, hereby surrender unconditionally to the Supreme Commander of the Allied forces. All ground, sea, air, and auxiliary forces within China were most... Okamura's mouth tightened as he read. The eyes of all the Chinese, of all the representatives of the other seven nations, were on him. The eyes of the world were on him. He put his signature to the document. He has surrendered a million Japanese troops in China and all the forces north of the 16th latitude, excepting those in Manchuria. Yes, and he has surrendered here in Nanking. Nanking. Nanking was again the capital. China had won its greatest triumph. Not only victory over the Japanese, but over disunity. This was a promise that China could have unity. That China indeed had won status as a nation. This was the freedom that had been envisioned by the man in the mausoleum on Purple Mountain. Listening to the Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat? For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. The principal voice was that of Howard McNear. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.